Welcome back. This is the We All Follow the Forest podcast. We're here for episode five. This time, Nottingham Forest have just come off the back of a draw, this time to Crystal Palace. It was an interesting weekend, one that I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get to go and see. Um, but the man that I'm uh, joined by today certainly did. And we've got a lot of things to cover and talk about. And uh, perhaps you can also give us some of your feedback as well, uh, looking back through this video. So, um, Dave, Dave Asperillo, as we're going to call him for this episode. How are you doing, my friend? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I'm good, Jamie. Nice to see you and um, good to have a little natter about uh, the club that we love, mate. Yeah, it was so very this is, interesting, this is... It, it sounds like one because I did actually get to listen to it on the radio and we're quite lucky in uh, Nottingham to have um, the likes of Colin Frey um, doing our commentary. So it was like I was at the game. I just closed my eyes and sat there with a cup of coffee and listened to Colin Frey yeah. commentating on the game. Yeah. And it sounded absolutely brilliant in many aspects, but in some aspects a little bit disappointing. And Colin mm. Frey sounded like he just desired a little bit more from Forrest. And so did Chris Cohen, to be honest, but mm. both mm. heaping praise on Forrest and clear um, positive moves, I would say, um, since the City game. So onwards and upwards. Just a shame mm. they couldn't get the three points. So, um, so if you know, if you don't know Dave, Dave is a bit of a legend. Um, he's a good friend of mine. We've done many streams together, um, and it's a real pleasure to have him on the podcast today because this is a a podcast where I try and interview a different Forest fan every week because everyone's got different perspectives. Some people might be Cooper out. Some people might be Cooper in. Some people might um, think Marillo's the best in the world, and some people might think Marillo's the best in the universe. They'd both be correct, I'd say. Um, but Dave, let, let's talk about um, that performance overall. Then we'll get to the individual performances. Mm. Um, what did you think of the game overall, the first, second half, and then obviously the end result? Well, I, I think um, Forest were the better team. I think um, Palace were clearly vulnerable given their awful injury situation. No Elise, uh, no Eze, excellent players. They were missing Dukura as well. They were missing Jefferson Lerma. They lost Jeff Schlupp um, not long into the game. Um, and they, I think for Palace, it was a matter of getting through the game <laughs> with as little damage as possible. And and it was a good match from a coaching point of view because, you know, Roy's as canny as they come and, and the Palace lads give the lot for him. They... You know, they're a settled bunch. They've been at this Premier League lark a lot longer than we have. You know, and, and you could say the same about our lads with, with Steve. And there's, there's there's a good vibe in both clubs. I mean, it, it was interesting looking in the round that nobody was looking at that as a, a relegation six-pointer. And it's, it's kind of just, you know, an evolution of Forrest not being, you know, considered at the moment by the the media has been a relegation threatened team. I, I still think we have to make ourselves safe. I still think we've got, you know, avoiding relegation is our first port of call along the way. But um, it, it had a feel of a of an, a, a mid-table match between two established Premier League teams. And I, you know, Palace have been that now for a while. You know, but the, the truism about Crystal Palace is that nobody really notices them and 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 that's a nice thing for them. And they finish eleventh or twelfth or tenth or whatever every year, and they're they're a standing dish in the Premier League. Forest, um, I think, are just beginning to evolve and progress, and go from being the you know scraping to survive team that we've been for a long time, and uh, becoming a team with aspiration to be in that middle echelon, if you like, with. The Fulhams, the Crystal Palaces, the Brentfords, um, Wolveses, you know, for us, that's that's where we want to think. I, I do think their aspirations <laughs> are are higher than that. Certainly within the with, certainly within the squad and probably within the coaching staff. But um, it was a game where I felt it was the first time that Forrest had been away from home in the Premier League, Jamie, and took the game to their opponent. On their opponent's ground, you know we the, the the first the fundamental thing for Forest certainly through last year when the away form was such a problem, and it was so you know the matches were so daunting for a team that had come up by the playoffs to to sort of scramble to the level that required. I, I just felt it on um, on Saturday that from the start Forest took the game to Palace. Now, you know a, a point away. I heard somebody make make the 
made the suggestion, and it's a good suggestion, that any point away from home in the Premier League is a, is a valuable one because the standard of the opposition, and, you know, that goes for all 19 of them, you know, um, is a good one. But I think it's a mark of how Forrest played on the day that the hindsight and pure hindsight is that could have won that and maybe should have won that. So I think it's a, there's a definite sense of evolution with Forrest in that I think we're moving towards and it's it's going to take time and it's not going to be a, a, a an accelerated progression but i think we're moving to the kind of football that steve and the coaching staff and i'm sure the lads themselves really want to play it because i think last year they they were selfless enough and aware enough as as individuals and as a group as a group to say well we may need to go away from what we'd like to do and, and reside in the area of what we have to do to stay up. And I just felt certainly in the first half that it was Forrest that were dictating the tempo of the game. And it was lovely to see. And it, it was a, a sign of progression, you know, and um, as I'm sure we'll come on to say and talk about, there were there are some really lovely moments um, for us in that game. Yeah. And, and as you say, it was a result, I think, that could have ended up in three points. It could have. Mm. I, I think in some mm. situations we got unlucky, especially with the Morgan Gibbs White mm. um, one. Mm. I mean, that was just so unlucky. You know, on another day, that's it bouncing was, off the inner it, side of the post and going in. It was a brilliant piece of football, Jamie. I mean, it, 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 it's a piece of football that you would have, you would have imagined that last year's version of Forest would have come up with. You know, a, a, a young Tyro of a centre half hitting a 40, 50 yard ball with perfect precision. It's come over Morgan's shoulder and he's somehow fashioned an attempt on goal now, you know, hits them, it's millimetres away from perfection, literally, because, you know, another inch to the right and it would have been one of the goals of the season. And, and I think it just summed up Forrest's growing confidence in their abilities and I'm not saying comfort in the Premier League because you, you can never be comfortable because you know every game is a is a mountain to climb. But it's almost as if Forrest is starting to believe in themselves a little bit more, and it was a wonderful bit of football. And for those of us, <laughs> I was like about five rows from the front in that away section at Sellers Park to see it unfold right in front of you was just magnificent. I mean, the ball from uh, Marillo was just a thing of beauty. I mean, I, I you know, when he hit it. I was put in mind of Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady. It was a bit of quarterbacking. It was absolutely brilliant. And Morgan, you know, such as his ability and his talent to fashion a chance out of that. I mean, it's uh, it was pretty staggering. It was like it was it was the first of a number of like great what if uh, moments. But it was it was lovely to see in, in the flesh, mate. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Murillo then, because he's a name that we've mentioned already a few times. And I think he's probably the most mentioned name um, from the weekend. And it's not just yeah. the run. It's not just the no. massive pass that he did no. that was was almost no. the perfect assist. Um, mm. And it's not just the quality defending. It's just the character. It's the, the you mm. know, the, the player that we've got on our hands here, genuinely mm. special. And we've seen it, if, you know, since Steve Cooper's come in, there's been players where you go, these guys are special. And these guys, mm. we're saying a special at the top level of the Premier League, playing against top opponents. If you're special in that mm. scenario, and if you're special mm. against a team like Crystal Palace, who've got great defenders, Joachim Anderson mm. and uh, yeah. Mark Gay, you know, yeah. brilliant very defenders. Good yeah, very um, good team, yeah. You, you are destined for big things. And for me, Murillo certainly looks that way. So what would mm. you say about his performance then? Because he just offers Forrest so, so well, much. Well, let's, let's, let's state a fact first. The fact is that this kid um, has come from another country to our country. It's a huge change in culture. It's a huge change in, I guess, lifestyle. You know, he's having to adapt. He's, he's still a boy, basically, um, having to adapt to new way of living, new surroundings, new people, which is daunting in itself. On top of that, He's only actually played 15 games of professional football. He played 13 for Corinthians and he's played two for Nottingham Forest. And 
I didn't, you know, I didn't really look at his highlights reel. Um, I saw bits of his highlights reel from Corinthians, and it was like, yeah, the kid looks good. You know, didn't knock your eye out. Um, but then, you know, I'm a bit sceptical. Often these highlight reels, Jamie, that I put together a little montage, and then they're, they're not always representative uh, of a player's, the full range of what a player can do. But what I've liked about is take the two games for us. What I really liked was I thought the first 15, 20 against Brentford, he looked a little bit overwhelmed to start with, which is totally understandable. And he gave the ball away a couple of times and he looked a little bit sort of trying to find his feet. And then he, from about 20 minutes on, he just sort of seemed to click uh, and get it. Uh, you know, I mean, Willie, Willie has been a great help to him. And and while we're talking about Murillo, let's just say a word for Willie. Willie's been a magnificent sign-in, you know. I mean, when he came last year, there wasn't a great fanfare. I don't think there was a great... Um, elation, if you like, about Willie signing, but the, the two and a bit million that we paid Wolves for him is really looking like a bargain. I think Willie, um, and you could have said this about Ola until Ola was injured, but Willie has maybe been our most consistent player this season. And he, he's he's unflappable, he's strong, he's obviously not the quickest, but his positional sense is great. And he's just a, a figure that exudes calm reassurance, you know. <laughs> To me, 90 minutes for Forrest is 90 minutes of nerves, hoping for like bursts of relief here here and there with a goal or whatever. But Willie, when I look at him, he just kind of exudes that sort of like, right, I know, yeah, I'm in control of this. I know what I'm doing. I know where to be. I know what um, steps to take and what other. And that is clearly, you know, Murillo's looking at, at Willie. And, and I think Willie's been great for Murillo. And, and Mar Murillo, in a way, is great. For Willie, they, it's almost like Murillo does certain things and Willie does certain other things, but the two dovetail really, really nicely. And I thought they were they were quietly excellent. If you think, I mean, that game really, the way I look at it, Forrest had five really good chances and Palace essentially had one that Mateta put, put past the way. Jordan Ayew hooked one over the bar in the first half. He also had a header, flashing header at the, at, the, at the near post, but they were not really great efforts. Certainly didn't make Matt Turner or any of the boys at, at the back for us have to think too much. Um, so really, you know, if one chance against Forest away from home in the Premier League, that is a definite step forward from where we've been um, certainly last season and um, to an extent in those first four unbelievably challenging away fixtures. So um, it looks a nice little combination. It's almost like it's like <laughs> master and pupil almost. But he, in the game against Brentford, he just seemed to really, within him, within his own mind, and he's, he just started to kind of believe in himself. I mean, there was a bit of play down the left-hand side in that game where he beat a couple of guys and then he had the audacity to flick a, a pass through a guy's legs. Now, you know, that's like, I mean, this kid's come from, Sao Paulo or wherever, wherever, and like, you know, blimey, he seems to be getting it really, really quickly. And then, I mean, at the weekend, he looked even more assured, you know, I mean, what I'm a bit wary of is, I mean, obviously, since Saturday tea time, there's been a hell of a lot of talk about him, and that's to his credit. He's created a buzz about himself, the young man has. We've just got to just temper it a little bit and say, well, he's done fantastic. He's had two great games. Let's see what he does over 10, over 20, over 30. The, the, the portents are great. The, 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 the early signs are that this is a kid who likes defending. He, he was he, he was really good when we went down to 10 against Brentford, cleared off the line. He seemed to enjoy being in the trenches, backs to the wall. Now, that's a great attitude. And, and again, from what little bits I've heard, and I'm obviously not inside the club, his attitude since since day one has been fantastic. In fact, I watched his, his interview, his initial interview that like all the lads gave. And okay, he spoke in Portuguese, and I don't understand Portuguese. But he he, was, he smiled and looked really, really cheerful all the way through it. Like he was really happy to be here. And, and from what Steve has said about him, because obviously it's been a lot of talks on Saturday, and that has translated onto the training pitch. Well, that, you know, any lad for any manager who's given you that kind of vibe is going to earn himself 
you know, A, the trust of his coach and, and, and his teammates and, and a place in the side. And I think he must have impressed Steve mightily for Steve to put him in against Brentford. Um, you know, and, and then Saturday, like you say, Palace, even, even a depleted Palace with Roy in charge is a difficult task because they they know how to navigate the Premier League over a decade to stay where they are. And, and they're, a, they're a smashing club, Crystal Palace, to do what they do. I remember when they first came up, like 2013 or whatever, mm. nobody gave them a prayer of staying up. And here they are, 10 years on. And it's almost like people don't... The greatest the greatest achievement of Crystal Palace is not to be not to be kind of talked about that much, not that to be that not to be noticed that much. And I'm I'm you know, what I'm hoping is that we can get to that level. I mean, you hear Callum Hudson the door saying we want top ten. Well, if the lads think they they're after top ten and Steve thinks they're after they're after top ten and Marinakis wants top ten, that's great. Personally, I'm like, well, let's not let's not run before we can walk. But but with uh, with Murillo, he just gives you that sense that Blimey, we might just have unearthed one, you know, and it, and it's got a little Brighton-y feel to it. You know, here's this mm. kid, he's going to be playing professional football six months. Somebody in our recruitment and, and player identification ranks has pulled off a real um, coup to get him in as a, as a Nottingham Forest player. I mean, it's the sort of thing that Brighton have been doing for ages now. I mean, like Brighton yesterday put, um, put two, two young lads in that, I think Julio and uh, Badella, I think, was the other lad they played. They both played excellent. It's almost like Deserby wasn't worried about putting these two guys in against Liverpool, of all people. And these two lads played really, really well. And it's it's a Brighton-y type thing that Steve has done with Murillo um, to put him in despite his tender years. And um, he's he's a unit. You know, he's not the tallest. And certainly, I mean, you know, you're, Willie's like a skyscraper and... He's like a New York townhouse by comparison, but he's he's strong and he's something about he's just got a, a certain kind of charisma, Murillo. But it's just two games, so I've loved what he's done. We all have loved what he's done these last 180 odd minutes, but now he has to do it against Luton, and then he goes into a run of Liverpool, Villa, West Ham, and Brighton, and and you know those are going to be. Each one of those is, a, is another mountain to climb, but so far, so good with him. Yeah, and I think it, I agree with, with everything you said. And it's, um, you don't want to put too much pressure on him by overpraising yeah. him. And that's the yeah. thing because he is young. And, you know, I think, yeah. I think it almost, um, I think, yeah, I think it's happened with a lot of players in the past. And sometimes it can be their downfall. Um, but he's in a good position. He's he's got a good mm. coach who I think yeah. um, wants to you know make this humble atmosphere, especially for younger mm. guys and um, mm. especially for like you know younger perhaps Brazilians, I suppose you could say, um, because mm. they've come from a lot less than a lot of other players, well, and you know it, it it's that kind of they've not come from as much, and now all of a sudden everything's there for them. Some things they I, haven't had ever, and it's such a big yeah. thing. So it's about you know maintaining that humbleness and. Uh, make sure yeah, they have the I right think, attitude. I think, Jamie, um, across the board, Nottingham Forest are a humble bunch. The humility, I think, is something Steve drills into them. You know, never get ahead of yourself. Never be too high. Never be too low. Stay on the level. I, I said on a on a show last week, uh, and I'm and I and I. The more I think about what I said, the more I kind of, I'm happy that I said it. It just seems to me that Forest have got their feet on the ground as a club, as a squad, as a coaching staff. I mean, the owner dream's big. That's his prerogative. But the day to day, the rest of us, I think we're all, we're all on a nice even keel. And I think when I look at the, the squad, there's a lovely, there are lovely little social aspects to it. I, I like the, you know, I, I was kind of thinking about it. I, I, I do. I love the squad photo day video. Mm. I thought it was fantastic. And I know everybody was looking at Ethan, looking fed up. Well, you know, you can understand Ethan looking fed up. He's the fourth choice goalkeeper. But maybe Ethan's just an interim. The rest were laughing and joking. The, the Brazilian boys were having a laugh amongst themselves. They were all taking the mick out of Andre Santos. And I think that's the Fabrizio Romano thing has been blown way out of proportion. I don't know if there's anything mm. to that at all. That was just somebody creating a story because he wanted to. I think that was pie in the sky, that. So the Brazilian boys were all getting on well. Then you've got the, I think you've, you can see the, the leaders in the group. So I kind of look at Serge, Joe, Ryan, Woody. Willie, Cheku, 
there's a bunch of guys there who, you know, are kind of the older heads, the older professionals. And I think there's just a nice covering of all the bases with the group. It, it, it's, it's, I'm so proud to support them. I think they're really good guys. You know, there's, I mean, like Moose got sent off last week, but that wasn't, that was Moose trying hard, but not having quite enough control. So, no, you know, no problem. I, mean, I don't see at the moment from my position way on the outside as a supporter, I don't see any disruptive um, presences or influences. It, it just seems like a happy ship. Mm. And it, it it came out in the way they played on Saturday. And and it to me, it certainly came out in the way that the 10 finished the game against Brentford. In fact, in a way, the 10 played better than the 11 had done up to Moose's departure. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, let, let's take... What we're talking about, guys who are, you know, progressing. Let, let's talk about Harry Toffolo. Yeah. Because for a lot of people, a lot of people, Harry last year was, he's come from Huddersfield. He'll never be any good. He, you know, he's he, he's always like a championship player. Why are we bothered signing him? You know, he was the mate waiting the O'Brien deal. Well, Lewis O'Brien's not here anymore. He, he is contractually, but he's at, he's at Middlesbrough. But Harry, you know, Harry's had his own sort of personal backstory to deal with. And he's, you know, his, his life, if you like, he's certainly the younger part of his life, the early part of his life, has been raked over by the authorities and, and there's been issues for him and, and what have you, and mental well-being issues and, and certain other issues. And the half an hour he produced against Brentford might have been his best half hour for Nottingham Forest since he joined. He was outstanding. He, he created uh, Nico's goal. He put two superb tackles in on the, the excellent Brian and Bumo to keep the 10... You know, at least level. Um, and, and Morgan obviously was great coming off the bench against Brentford. You know, obviously he had, uh, like Harry, he had a hand, a hand in Nico's goal, but he also produced that iconic run back to stop Brian and Bumo, which gave everybody in the in the ground a lift. You know, but I looked at Harry Toffolo the weekend, and I mean, you know, he could have scored the, the shot he had from outside the box. And you know, he, he was, I think he was, the, he was the only bloke between everybody else and. Um, and uh, to Matty in goal, the ball come out to him and he, he hit it. I mean, from where I was, I was side on and it went like a tracer bullet. I didn't realise actually how much on target the shot was, you know. But not only that, Harry was really, really neat and tidy and everything. Did uh, Jessamyn Raksaki had him on his toes for 10 or 15, but then Harry won his, you know, gradually got back into his battle. And I thought, so he was quietly excellent, Harry. And he, he's another one. I mean, he's a... He's a kind of an older version, but he's learning about the Premier League as well. And, and his attitude has been, been terrific. So, I mean, the bottom line is, Jamie, for me, from what I saw at Sellers Park on, on Saturday, not one of ours had what you considered a really poor game. No, every, every one of them did OK. Callum did OK, even though he came off. Anthony came on and did some good stuff. Divock came on and did good stuff. You know, it was a good, you know... I mean, Murillo has been the high, has been the the name that leaps off the page, and he was a an, an eight, maybe a nine, but everybody else was a good solid seven. I would have said. I don't think anybody had a poor game. I mean, what, the, what the about Manga before, Mangala, Dave? What about Mangala? Because he's I, he's been someone that gets on with it so so quietly, and he, he, I've yes. always rated him. I've always rated him, but yes. not everyone's felt the same. But you know, this yeah. season he's taken that yeah. next step up for me. He looks he absolutely. Has, Jamie. Yeah, and mate, it's a great point you make, and you you bang on the same wavelength as me about Oral. Or Oral is is again, he's he's really good at keeping the ball. He's good yeah. at passing the ball. He keeps the game as simple as possible. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't get noticed. Maybe that's again to his credit. He's just doing the fundamentals really well. If you you know if if he was doing the fundamentals poorly, boy, would you notice him. But what I like about Oral, he's now growing into this role of keeping things ticking along, fetching and carrying, you know, being where you need him to be. I think I think the midfield three, I think he enjoys playing with Ibrahim. And I think he enjoys playing with Nico. <laughs> the three of them, they just, just they've got a nice feel to it. And then, and then obviously Saturday, we put Yatesy on. <laughs> Yatesy comes on and Yatesy lets everybody know what he's doing. And he, he absolutely loves Ryan Yates and, and always will do. But yeah, Oral Mangala is the most under the radar member of our squad, I think. And and I'm trying to think, is that is that is that people not giving him the credit he deserves? Or is it just the way he plays 
doesn't lend itself to oh blimey that guy made a mistake he, he's very he's a really good solid player or man girl i mean his, his performances for belgium recently have been uh really good i didn't see belgium during the the last international break from but the reports i read said that he'd been excellent for belgium you know and you think about the players that they've got at their disposal belgium if he's in that side he's no mug and i have a lot of time for oral he's um he'll be one of those guys that i'd like to think if he carries on playing the way he is that when we look back in years after he's left nottingham forest we'll, we'll look back at him and think he was a good lad that guy and um he's uh He's he's such a quiet lad in the way he goes about stuff. So he's a he's a good player. I like the way he, he he finds a little bit of space and he plays a nice simple pass. You know, he, he, he I don't think you're gonna get Oral hitting 30, 40 yard balls, whatever. He's not gonna do the spectacular stuff. But what Oral Mangala seems, the impression he seems to give to me is he knows his game. He knows the parameters of his game and he works within those. And he's a He's a good player or a man girl. I have a lot of time for it. And I do like the fact that he is he go, he is uh, one of the quieter members of the squad. But you know, you need you need that blend. Mm. You need your I, <laughs> you know, you need that kind of you, you need your extroverts and your introverts. And again, I just feel that we're not there yet. I still think there's a lot of work to be done. We're still we are a work in progress, but we just feel that week on week the blend is beginning. To be arrived i mean my view on the season so far what have we played we've played eight now is it hmm. two wins three draws three defeats there hasn't been a flat out stinker of a performance from the team in any of those eight there have been periods where they've been very good there have been periods where they could have been better but i don't think we're looking back i mean if, if you think i watched the bournemouth podcast today the brilliant back of the net podcast fantastic those guys at, at bournemouth and they are raking over the coals of their, their defeat at Everton. And it's a, it's a proper inquest. It's an autopsy, if you like. Now, we're gonna, there's going to be a bad one come along. It's just the nature of life, the nature of football. It won't be this good all the time. And you could argue that the, the bad thing about Saturday, if there is a bad thing, didn't make it count in terms of a goal. So we need to find a goal from somewhere, especially now Tywo is going to be out for a few weeks. But... When I compare the way the, the Bournemouth guys are going about their performance at Goodison to the way we're going about what we did at Palace and, and prior to that, what we did against Brentford or at the Etihad or you know the games that preceding, we haven't had to have one of these, you know, sort of uh, sessions of grieving over a, over a display yet. So I think it's to Forrest's great credit, you know, um, there's a hell of a long way to go. They're nothing like... Uh, I suspect what we as supporters want them to be, or what Steve wants them to be, but the 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 direction of the of the evolution is pretty good at the moment, mate. I would say. Yeah, and I think when when talking about Mangala, I'll just briefly go back to it. I just think he's someone that does the simple things right, and sometimes mm. that's what football demands. Football demands yeah, yeah. simplicity a little yeah. bit more because yeah. I think people think maybe people more in my generation um, <laughs> just think about the flicks. They're only thinking yeah. about, you know, when you go on YouTube, all you're watching is the flicks. And I don't, you know, I, I understand why, because people don't want to just go and look at someone who makes five-yard passes. Mm -hmm. But maybe people don't understand the importance of those five-yard passes because mm -hmm. ball retention is so important. Um, yeah. And where you're putting the ball, finding the space, it's such a big skill. So, yeah, you know, 1v1s are so exciting. But there's something about Oral Mangala's game where I go, you excite me, even though what you're doing isn't that exciting. It's and just simple, and I love it. Yeah, it's. A, I think it's. A, it is. A, it maybe is a generational thing, Jamie. And I think the the thing that splits, you like your generation and my generation, is is FIFA, and showboating oh. and soccer AM and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's great. It's great because it gives folklore to football and it gives like mythology to football. But uh, you know, a lot a lot of that younger generation that wants the fancy stuff, street street football, if you like, what would they have made of, of McGovern? or Clark mm. or Burns or Archie Gemmell or, you know, Larry Lloyd, Dave Needham, those great, great players who played for us. The, the Miracle Men were all solid citizens who did the simple stuff brilliantly. And he 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 got them together. He wanted guys, to hit the greatest, the great one. He wanted them to come together and keep it a simple game. He didn't want to clutter it up with 
science and, 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 and nonsense and metaphysical stuff. He didn't want any of that. And they came together brilliantly to form one of the greatest teams football's ever, ever seen. I mean, they did have one absolute freakish and orthodox wizard out on the left-hand side. It was like, who's without a shadow of a doubt, in my view, and this is no disrespect to anybody else who's ever put the Gary Ball down. He's the greatest player who ever played for our club. Now, he could do things that it was almost like he'd say to the others, give him the ball because he's better than you. But they... They came together and, and I, I mean, John McGovern to me is the classic example. John's one of the greatest players ever played for our, for our club. John, John's raised two European Cups. It makes him one of the greatest players of all time in that regard. But a lot of people watching John McGovern would play would go, oh, he doesn't do anything. What's he What's he about? Where's the fancy stuff? I've got and a story you know, about this. And you know, Jamie, Oral Mangala in many ways is like that. And mm. and and I think I think Oral Mangala, there are, I think what you've got, there are guys who are, fans players and I think there are guys who are players players and I think Oral is the sort of guy I think the lads I, I would imagine he's a really popular guy in the dressing room and, the, and I think he's popular in the way he plays and he, he, he's a he's a, a like a he, he helps I mean Oral, uh, Ibrahim Sangari has got better you know gradually he's still not he's still not anywhere like the Sangari that we want though that was a PSV but I think Oral's helping him, and I think Oral's saying to Nico Dominguez, "You go and press because you're the king of the press, and I'll do my stuff." And at the moment, the balance is good, and I think it's, I think Oral Mangala is a symbol of the unselfishness, and and if you like the the will to play for another teammate that's in our, in our in our side of the moment, and it's helping us to progress. Yeah, we were talking about the um, a moment ago about Mangala and also McGovern and how in the way of um, maybe not noticing just how good these players are, yeah. kind of compare yeah. the two. And I was uh, I was having some lunch with Gary Bertles last week and he mm. was saying to me, or it was the week before actually, and he was saying to me, you know, John McGovern, I don't think at the time we appreciated him enough because mm. he said, you know, we looked back then and we were like, you know, oh, you know, he didn't really do a lot. And then he says, but you know now, when I look back at games, when I talk to other, you know, former Forest players, yeah. we all yeah. say... You know, he was actually one of the best. He was, he just, was. We didn't appreciate him enough. And I think the one thing I don't want to do now is, in a way, repeat that mistake and not give players like Mangala. And it's not just Mangala, by the way, mm. because there's a lot of players in that Forest team that I don't think get enough appreciation. Um, yeah. But for me, Mangala, I just don't want to see that um, mistake repeated of not giving him enough appreciation mm. now. Um, but yeah. I want to, um, I want to talk about a player that maybe should get a little bit more appreciation, but not too much. Um, and it's a it's a strange a strange one for me because Tyro's absence has left a massive hole. And I don't think that there's mm. anybody in our team at the moment that's mm. capable of replacing that. And that sounds horrible, no. Um, mm. but no no other striker offers what Tyro offers. And for mm. me, that might be a concern because you're looking into future transfer windows. Maybe we should be thinking, should we look for someone who's a little bit more prolific, mm. who can offer something mm. um, different but similar to Tyro in a way? Mm -hmm. um, but Chris Wood, I thought that his, you know, his hold-up play does mm -hmm. look improved. I noticed it in mm -hmm. pre-season, but it's definitely when he's come on, he looks mm -hmm. like he really wants to play. He looks like he's slimmed down a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, he does look like he wants to score. And I feel for him a little bit because although I don't think that he is good enough to take us forward, um, and in fairness, I wasn't that keen on him coming to Forest. when he goes on the pitch, I do feel he puts the effort in, but he's just not quite the right man for the job. And he, it's not his fault. But I just don't think he's that replacement for Tyro or the the backup for Tyro that really we need. Um, but I've mm. got to give it to him. I think he's putting in effort. So, what are your thoughts mm. on Chris Wood? Well, he certainly um, uh, improved his fitness from last season. I mean, he was mm. he was a bit unlucky last season. That injury he picked up at Tottenham at the time, certainly to me in the stands at, at Tottenham, looked a bump, looked like a dead leg or something to me. But he ended up with a hematoma, and it was clearly a bad injury. Um, and obviously then it's like, you know, where does Woody fit in? What, what you know, what's his role going to be? And it, it was hard at the time to kind of envisage him playing much of a part. But what I remember is like uh, him coming on, running onto the field uh, against Sheffield United. And as he ran onto the field, and there were a couple of people next to me in the stand, what's he putting him on for and all this? And, and there was some less, even less complimentary things said about Chris as he came on. But I thought to myself, I mean, he looks a bit sharper and a bit fitter than last year. And lo and behold, he got us a priceless winner with actually a brilliant bit of play that didn't look at all on 
you, you couldn't see where that against. I thought, I mean, really, I think our away performances have been much better than our home performances. I mean, Great, we picked yeah, up five so. points at home. I don't, I think Sheffield United could go away from the city ground thinking mm, we could have got something there. They, you know, Matty Turner saves from Benny Traore, key turning point. If that goes in and Blades are two or not, then it's a real uphill battle for Forrest. And Woody gave us a goal that at the time I couldn't see where, where a goal was going to come from for us. And it was a fantastic header. You know, and, and I just, the only thing with him is, I'm not sure. I think he's a great guy in the squad. He's obviously part of the leadership group. I think he's he's really popular amongst the lads. And I think he, I think from what I can gather, Steve gets him to speak in the dressing room and all that. And he's got, he's got that been there, sort of done it presence about him. But now that Taiwo is going to be out, and Taiwo is, I think Taiwo is the best striker um, for any of the clubs who are kind of, if you like bottom half clubs, certainly now Tony's out, you mm. know, with Tony not playing. I mean, Tony would be the best if he was to be playing for Brent, but I think Taiwo is the best striker sent forward of any of the clubs from, you know, the, the Palace and Fulham down to the teams at the bottom. I mean, some of those teams at the bottom, Everton could have won more games if they'd had Taiwo. Wolves would have won more games if they'd had Taiwo. You know, Luton might, uh, Burnley and Luton and Blades would love a guy like Taiwo, you know, so I think we're very lucky to have him. And I think the great skill, the great beauty of Taiwo is he's, he's not like anybody else. He's sort of a big guy who can break the lines. They've added this, they coached him beautifully to add further dimensions to his game. Holding up is better. I was, I was, his highlight reel, if we're going to talk about highlight reels for Taiwo at Union Berlin, was a ball over the top and the big man running onto it and clattering everybody out of the way and leaving everybody behind him. Now he's bringing others into play. I mean, the classic example for me was the goal that Danilo scored against Brighton. Tyro held it up, flicked it around the corner. Danilo ran onto it, put it in the bottom corner. And that's that's what that's the new bits of Tyro that have been added on. And Tyro is again, he's not the complete finished package yet. And there's lots more to go with Tyro, but he's got himself to a point where he's almost getting talismanic now. Without him, um, it's going to be difficult to fit. Woody will hold up really, really well, and he's physical. And I think from what I can gather, what Steve has been alluding to is that he likes the idea that Woody occupies other people to allow space for others of our guys, the Morgans and the Callums and the Antonys and the Nico Dominguez's of our team to go and exploit the space that Woody creates with his presence. But I just think um, my my view is that when we come to Luton. I'm going to Divock Origi up front. Um, and I think then Woody to come off the bench. Now, he, he was he was manful in his effort at Crystal Palace, but it just kind of didn't quite work for me. He, it didn't seem, and this is no disrespect to him, because there's, there's nobody tries harder than Chris Wood, and he's a good guy, right? But it just didn't seem like he was a, a, a fit. It was almost like, in fact... The, the, the game was in three phases, Jimmy. I thought we, we bossed the first half. Palace then had a 20, 25 minutes where I think they were the better side, culminating with the Mateta chance. And then, and this is really, really good on our part, Forrest then grabbed the initiative back towards the end, which led to Gonzalo's effort and Nico Dominguez's effort. And that coincided with Divock Origi coming onto the field. And I think against Luton, I'm going Divock Origi to start. I just think he's a bit more it's a bit more flexibility physically and mm. in terms of the system with Divock than there is with Woody. But Woody will play a part. I mean, you know, I, I, it, my guess is that against Luton, I think Steve will go with Woody against Luton. Personally, I'd go with Divock. I, 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 we're probably like going to reverse. Steve will probably go with Woody bring Divock on. I'm the other way around. I'm going to go Divock, give him 60, 70, see how it goes, took Woody on later. I mean, he might even, I mean, you know, with the 10 men against Brentford, both of them were on the field and, you know, could easily, a few inches for Woody to get higher, we could have got a, a winner. I mean, bizarre as it sounds against Brentford. So I think they've both got things to offer, but I just think Divock is a, is a slightly better fit for the way Forrest, Steve are now wanting to play, I think. So, but the, the, where the goals are going to come from in Taiwo's absence um, is an issue to me. But um, the good thing about Forrest, in a way, is okay, 
goal scoring has looked a bit of an issue the last two or three games. But it's not for lack of trying. And I'd be more worried if they were creating no chances. I mean, five really good opportunities at, at Crystal Palace. A lot of sides, I mean, Wolves went there and got beat, didn't create that many chances. You know, other teams will go to Crystal Palace this year. Certainly when Palace get their their, their main men back and they will struggle to, to carve out that many chances. So it's um, it's just those tiny margins, mate, you know. Mm. Well, they, they, you know, they come off that United win as well. Full of motivation. Mm. Obviously, the injuries are a massive thing for them. So, you know, they're a mm. very good team. And, I, you yeah. know, I, I like watching Crystal Palace because, you know, I do feel yeah, they I are do. a good team. But they haven't yeah. moved much in years. But that's just how it is. They're an established team. And I think that most fans are dreaming of that. So, I mean, I'm definitely dreaming we, of that. I would. I'd take that now, mate. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It, I, think, I think there was a really good point I heard on another podcast today where they were sort of saying that, you know, Palace's aspirations, I think, are different to ours. Palace are kind of... I'm not saying they're happy and settled. Every football club is striving to be better. That's the whole point of it. Getting better from day to day, minute upon minute, whatever. But it's almost like with Palace, they've got themselves into this, this kind of vacuum, void, limbo, whatever you want to call it, where they're kind of never going to challenge those guys at the top, but they're never going to be in any danger from those guys below them. And I think... I don't think Forrester are looking to emulate Palace in that list. I think the team that Forrester are looking to emulate and make, and, and certainly I guess it's Mr. Marinakis's view, they're looking to emulate Brighton and Ove Albion. That's that's kind of where Forrest want to be. And so I think, um, you know, I can see the sort of the the pot at the end of the of this particular rainbow. You know, for us, I mean, we're thirteenth, and 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 it, it's been interesting that the media and and which is pervasive and all around us and surrounds us at the moment, hasn't had um, now regards us as a mid... I think after the Manchester City game, they, they, or around the Manchester City game, well, you know, well, Manchester City should be beating a, 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 a mid-table team. I'm thinking, well, that's a nice little compliment for us. We were relegation strugglers last year. So I think what I see with us is some nice evolution, progression... Um, the trick now for the coaching staff and the squad is to not regress, not to squander the steps that they've taken and the good work that they've done to be where they are. I mean, the season finished now, finished 13. Well, that's that's progress. I mean, to lose 6-0 last year at Manchester City, to only lose 2-0 this year, there, there's some progress for you in, 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 a, in a tiny nutshell. I, there's just a, a nice vibe about our our squad and and you know there's a nice vibe about our club certainly these last two years and certainly in comparison to the 23 or 24 that preceded it where it, we were effectively embarrassing a bit of a standing joke changing managers every 10 minutes underachieving i think nottingham forest is rediscovering its self-respect and forcing others to slowly increase their respect for us and and to me Saturday, while it was sort of, well, I could have won that, should have got three points. There's loads of good to take from it. And I think, you know, build on that. I mean, beating Luton would be great. Be beating Luton gives us 12 points. Then we, you know, Anfield is going to be incredibly difficult because I think Liverpool are far better this season than they were last year. Um, it'd be nice to think we'll kind of, play as well at Anfield as we did when we went there in, in April, but I think it's going to be very difficult. And then, you know, the next three after that, Villa, West Ham and Brian, I mean, they're three real, really tough tasks. So, you know, there's a lot of daunting tasks ahead, which require us to stay humble and grounded and work hard. And that is the impression that our coaching staff and the members of our squad give. That, that is their, that is their, absolute baseline in all of this so I, i'm i'm not going you know decking the the place with bunted open top bus tours and all this kind of stuff jamie but there's good good feeling good signs you know cautiously good signs about forest well on that note i think we can say that there's a good feel yeah i'm feeling good ahead of luton i think dave's made me feel a little bit better about going and playing uh 
Luton and Liverpool and you know West Ham and Brighton, you know, as you say, tough games. Um, I'm looking forward to Liverpool because I've got a, a weekend away in Newcastle as well, as we spoke about before the podcast. We won't say anything more than that. Um, but you know, it's gonna be a, a good, you know, few weeks after the international break, and it will be tough. Yeah. Um yeah, but will. just don't, you know, not take and anything starting, for granted. Jamie, Jamie, sorry to cut across you, starting with Luton. Nobody associated with Nottingham Forest should in any way, shape, or form underestimate Luton Town. Nobody. No, Luton Town have got one major advantage over every other team in this division, and that is that nobody gives them a prayer in any game. They carry no expectation. They carry no no pressure, no baggage. Luton Town are already into bonus territory. Luton Town can come to the city ground, and most people say, oh, they'll lose there. We must... Brian Clough would tell you that a game against Luton Town... He, 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 my way of thinking is that when we go to Anfield, we're not expected to win, so there's no pressure on us at Anfield. Similarly, there's no pressure on Luton Town coming to us on October the 21st. It's a very, very difficult game, and it, I don't want after the, the good vibes of the first, you know, we've made a decent start, not at a fantastic start, but a decent start, a better start than last year. I don't want us to squander it by taking Luton Town lightly at all. I don't think, I don't think, certainly our coach won't. And I think he'll drill it into them, you know, and Luton, Luton will look at us and think, ah, that's one of the teams we maybe could nick get something off. So I think it's a very, very difficult game. And, and the truth of the matter is, the most difficult game is always the next one, whoever you're playing. Well, that's it. We've just got to give it our all. Uh, and play them as if you know we're playing Man City or United, or we just got to give Absolutely. it to every team, and you've got to be a positive and attacking. So, um, yeah. we're looking forward to, to that game. We'll be doing a preview of that game as well. Um, just before I'll let you know more details, hang around on my YouTube community if you want to know more, uh, or my Instagram, wherever you find me. Um, and we'll be bringing you more stuff from that. But, Dave, thank you for joining me. Episode Bless five. You, Jamie. And it's it's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed talking. Thank I you, always mate. enjoy talking about football with Dave. Usually I get yeah. longer than this, though, I must say, because when we're <laughs> travelling to the game, we have before and after. Yeah, we I should record that. To be, yeah, I thought to myself, you know, circumspection is the order of the day today, Jamie, <laughs> rather than another Asbury rambling on. You know, my conversations often go on these winding paths that, you know, eventually find a, a bit like a Murillo run, if you like. But, um, you know, I've decided, that, you know, Let's be a little bit more, um, yeah, circumspect, mate. It's better, yeah. isn't it? Well, we always enjoy a chat, and it's always good to talk about the club yeah, we love as well. So oh, let's hope that Forrest can pick up a few points along the way. Tough games incoming, but reasons for optimism. Lots of reasons mm. for optimism. Keep mm. smiling, be happy, enjoy the football, and we'll see you next week for episode six. But if you've enjoyed this episode, episode five, we'll follow the Forest podcast bit of a mouthful that um, please drop a like give us your feedback and also subscribe as well if you've enjoyed it so take care come on you red